feel like a, a bit of a motivational speaker holding this here, but uh, you know, two caveats before we begin. Um, the study that you may have noticed in the paper or in the abstract it mentions as a study of urban sustainability. And what happened was initially this was catered towards urban governance, but as we got further into the paper, we discovered that this was about sustainability as a more broader trend. Um, second point to mention is that, um, you know, if you've seen the paper, uh, I was very happy when I approached Mary Lauren, she, she uh, asked to join this project. But on the downside of that, you have two people who really love to explain themselves, so you have a paper which is about 70% too long. So, and still not finished. So we still have a bit to go, but um, I'm gonna try and cover all of that today. Um, so what, I, what I'm looking at in this paper is, you know, I was really interested in the notion of sustainability. And um, when I started investigating this, I found that there were a lot of terms that were used interchangeably, sustainability, sustainable development, resilience, environmentalism, et cetera. And what I wanted to do here is sort of disentangle these different notions. And I found that a really good way to frame this was through the notion of path generation. Um, path generation as its beginnings has the notion of path dependence. And I don't need to go too much into this because you know we have the classical example of the QWERTY keyboard a very inefficient layout which should have been replaced by Dvorak, but because you had secretaries trained to use this sort of uh, format, because you had uh, typing schools that trained people how to use this, you had uh, manufacturers that built keyboards in this particular way, it became locked in, despite being inefficient. Um, so pad dependence here I've sort of characterized as having these three different phases based on the AMR piece in uh, 2009, a very, very nicely written piece. Um, in particular, you have three development phases. First, you have a singular historic event, and through time, you have certain reinforcement processes that eventually end up locking in one particular path. Um, what's key about this whole process is that these pads are not necessarily efficient, as with the notion of, as with the example of QWERTY. Another more uh, prominent example is with VHS and Betamax. Uh, VHS was a clearly inferior uh, quality to Betamax, but you know, for the same reason it got locked in by virtue of having these first mover advantages. And sort of to you know, illustrate this, um, you have here in the first phase, you have a number of options that can be taken, but you know, gradually over time, you sort of end up focusing uh, and moving towards one particular path. Um, but what we want to emphasize here is that you have critical junctures here, like here and here. Um, and these are sort of the events that end up reinforcing a particular path. Um, so this is uh, all well and good for the level of technology, but you can also apply this to, to a societal level. Um, and in particular, this has been done with the varieties of capitalism uh, literature, where you have certain sub subsystems, and these subsystems end up reinforcing one another. And sort of just to give you a sort of good example of that is, is this vehicle over here. This uh, is the F-35. Um, you know, it's projected to cost over its lifetime about $1.3 trillion over the next 30 years. How do you justify spending $1.3 trillion you know, when you have a debt which is, what, 15 trillion? Uh, when you have annual deficits which are, which are massive. And the reason why you can justify doing this, even though aerial warfare is somewhat of an obsolete, uh, is, an, is an obsolete form of warfare when you have more ground-based uh, activities, the reason why you can do this is because of the military industrial complex, right? You have not just the military that purchases, you have Lockheed Martin who's producing this. You have a number of employees who are, who are, uh, who are employed both by the military and by uh, Lockheed Martin. So, you know, these, and in particular you have lobbying efforts as well that seek to, you know, lock in this particular path. So this is sort of a very nice example about how you have, um, uh, path dependence at a societal level. Um, so it's fine, we've already demonstrated how stability occurs, but if you have such a strong lock-in, how, how do you account for the notion of transformative change? And there's sort of been two approaches that, that, have been, that have taken place. And the first is sort of this externally driven approach that you have this punctuated equilibrium. You have this external force that sort of dislodges uh, a path, um, and this has sort of fallen out of favor because we note that a lot of the changes can't really be accounted for in terms of revolutionary change. So instead what you have is three separate approaches, and this is sort of uh, my reading of, of 
how you have more agentic-based action here. So first of all, you have paths. If you'll, I'll go back to my, my previous example earlier. Over here, you can notice that despite the fact that these were paths not taken, there are still some sort of remnants. There's still some sort of artifacts that remain. And what actors can do is they can sort of employ that in order to sort of shift the direction of paths, right? And they can in, do this through, through bricolage, they can do this through, through, through reconfiguration, through recombination, et cetera. Alternatively, we also understand that actors are embedded in multiple fields so that you know, they can engage in transposition of practices from one field to another. And sort of the newest sort of advancement of this theory is, is this notion of path creation that sort of says, well, any sort of stability that we have is actually only provisional. It's only temporary. And if you have a change in sense-making activities, it happens in a very gradual manner, but that sort of shifts uh, a path. Um, so I've sort of made this division where you have an old sort of revolutionary account of change, and you have newer, more agentic-based action. So how do you sort of reconcile these two together? And I've done that through the notion of path generation, which serendipitously happens to be Mario Loris' uh, theory as well. So um, at the <laughs> we framed it in this way as well. Um, at the macro level, you have changes that occur because you have small critical junctures. And you have transformation that occurs because you have societal paths that sort of interact with one another. Um, what's key about this is that you know, this, this still fits in with the notion that it's not revolutionary change. It's indeed very incremental, but in the end, it turns out being substantial. And also, we want to emphasize here that, you know, individual actors here are indeed important, but we don't want to privilege them too much. They are important in the sense that they mobilize together. They act in concert with, with, other, with other actors. And Interesting enough, there's also an inherent level of unpredictability in this whole process. You can't really trace how a path is going to unfold. You can only do so in, in retrospect. So before I sort of get into more contemporary environmentalism, I just want to outline quickly um, sort of the history of sustainability or the history of environmentalism. Um, this sort of stems back from the first industrial revolution. Uh, and, you know, it stems really from Germany, where you had Alexander von Humboldt, who, who was really concerned about the drainage, deforestation, mining activities that were taking place. And he sort of saw a unity of nature, an intrinsic value in nature of itself. And this sort of stemmed through and influenced subsequent movements in the U.S. And there are two movements here which, which we want to emphasize. First is the notion of preservationism. This takes the Humboldt, Humboldt's idea that um, you know, nature has intrinsic value. And uh, Thoreau was, was, was a big proponent of this. Um, on the other hand, you have conservationism. And conservationism is really what we'd associate currently with sustainability. It's a notion that we preserve nature because if we don't do it, then you know, at some point, um, you know, it's gonna come back to harm us as humans rather than actually nature having its own intrinsic value. Fast forward a little bit to the early part of the 20th century, and what's really interesting about the environmentalism movement is that it gets tied really closely with eugenics. And it's funny because um, in this sense, conservationism is, is, is sort of linked together by Madison Grant with eugenics in the sense that we need a limitation to growth, uh, to human population growth, but the way we do that is by sort of privileging certain racial groups and uh, sort of limiting the growth of, of other groups. Um, what happens uh, about 20, 30 years later is you have this man called Julian Huxley who appears and he says, well, you know, he takes a Spencer in view to, to, to population growth and he says, we should be limiting the growth of lower classes. So he takes out the, he evacuates the component of race, but he still maintains this whole Malthus, Malthusian idea of, of population growth. Oh, great, <laughs> I have to go fast. Um, but what's interesting is he becomes the founder of UNESCO and, and uh, the World Wildlife Fund. So here he is, he's sort of the, the driver. So I'm gonna quickly go through the, the, three, the three trends of sustainable development, uh, sustainability and resilience. Um, so over here, we have the key moments uh, of, of when sustainable development formed. And um, initially what happened is you have a group of concerned citizens, scientists, et cetera, who came together 
with this very same Malthusian idea that you know, we have to limit growth because uh, we, we have to, growth is limited because populations are growing. Um, and throughout here, you have a number, of inc a number of steps which end up becoming our common future, which is the most prominent uh, sustainable development publication you know, today. This is really the start of, uh, of the global movement. Um, the key actors here, Jorgen Randers, who is a Norwegian uh, scientist, Gro Harlem Brundtland, uh, who chaired the Brundtland Report. But the key person who I want to outline here is Ashok Kosla. He was really influential throughout this whole process. He's the founder of the Club of Rome. He was involved in the World Conservation Strategy, the drafting of it, and he was an advisor to Harlem, Gro Harlem Brundtland throughout this process. So these three actors, especially Kosla in general, they're the ones who sort of formed and emerged and allowed this, this transnational process to emerge, this transnational movement to emerge. Um, I'll skip this part here so for sake of time. What I want to move to now is sustainability because this is a really interesting topic here. Uh, and I'll, I'll go back to this notion of think tanks as well as outlined by Christina. Um, so we, we know that you know, in, in 1947, um, the Mont Pelerin Society formed. Uh, a number of notable thinkers, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, Frederick Hayek, to sort of advance the notion that free market principles and personal choice should be sort of key elements of our society. Um, and what happened is, instead of making sort of more direct efforts to influence policy, they went through in the more roundabout way, uh, through the establishment of think tanks, especially in the 1970s, the Center for Policy Studies, um, the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, all major, uh, uh, all major think tanks. But what happened is, in the late 1970s, they started making more direct efforts at influencing policy. And uh, Jan, you posed a question to Christina about, you know, well, what are the more, like, sort of tangible outcomes? And Reagan's uh, election is, is a great example. Out of the 76 economic advisors on his, on his election campaign, um, 26 of them were, were Mon Pelerin Society members, direct Mon Pelerin Society members. So, you know, there they had a very clear impact. And two paths that I want to outline here as a result of neoliberalism are first, new public management, which is sort of the public sector governance model, as we, we all know, which is really an emphasis on outcomes, really an emphasis on efficiency, downsizing, and a search for excellence. And these are all the major institutions, OECD, the World Bank, the UN, et cetera, have all been influenced by this to a certain degree. Secondly is the Audit Society, which is a subpath, which is sort of derived from new public management. And this is the notion that everything can be and should be audited. Um, accounting firms sort of pushed out the state as, as the primary verifier. And as such, you have a number of, of, of audits that emerge, medical audits, teaching audits, um, uh, you know, management audits, of course. Um, so here the focus is really on, on indicators and measurement. So what has been the result of this? Um, these two paths intersecting environmentalism and, and uh, uh, NPM and the Audit Society. Uh, what we can say is that starting from the early 1990s, we had one particular man. I'll sh he shows up here. Yes. He's a Swiss businessman called Stephen, Stefan Schmidheine. So he also has strong links to the, to the Mont Pelerin Society, uh, a very pr prominent uh, proponent of, of neoliberalism as well. He says um, he's appointed chair of uh, ministry, wait, the chair of business and development at the 1992 Rio summit. And what he does is he says, well, he's extremely enamored by the ISO 9000 system. And he says, well, we should introduce that into uh, the environmental movement. And so he's extremely influential in creating the ISO 14000 system. And from there, you have a number of other systems that are created. The Forest, uh, forest Stewardship Certification, uh, LEED, Triple Bottom Line, a number of other uh, standards which stem from the ISO 14000. Um, and on top of that, within the transnational realm, you have a number of uh, organizations, the OECD, OECD, WTO, World Bank, et cetera, who start doing more and more frequent evaluations in line with NPM, in line with the Audit Society. And on top of that, furthermore, you have, you have sustainability emerging as a science, as a problem-driven discipline, very much focused on outcomes. And so what we see from this is you have a more managerial style of environmentalism here. 
Um, and as opposed to sustainable de development, sustainability is really being advocated by corporations here in this sense, um, which really contrasts it with the state. The final sort of phase I want to outline here is, is, is resilience here. And this is sort of what I want to sketch as, as, as the upcoming phase. It's, it's still emergent. And indeed, there's a lot of overlap between these three phases. But um, resilience is, is sort of driven by the idea that you know, we're facing a number of transboundary crises here. Uh, you have the Mumbai terror attacks. You have, uh, you have the Fukushima nuclear disaster. You have, obviously, the economic crisis. Um, and in such, in such a sort of uncertain environment, you, you know, there's, there's a certain consciousness of catastrophe that's, that's emerged. Uh, but the main actors who are sort of driving this, this, this awareness of risk is, is, is insurance, naturally. And this stems from the period 1987 to 1992. And between that five-year period, you had 15 catastrophes which, which, end up, uh, which end up producing claims of at least $1 billion each. And that hadn't happened for the previous 20 years. So within that one short five-year span, you had an extremely high expense for the insurance industry. So their reaction to that was to, well, we have to produce more proactive uh, risk mitigation strategies. We have to sort of instill risk, um, risk awareness into, into, into the general public. So what happens is that they increasingly start in, uh, establishing risk management programs. And um, within the transnational realm as well, a number of, of institutions have, have done so. The United States um, disaster reduction uh, strategies, for example. So I sketch here briefly what, what, our, what, this, new, what this new realm is, uh, what this new uh, phase is here. And, You'll notice that the indicators from sustainability do remain, but instead of being focused on this multi-dimensional construct of, of, uh, of, of social, environmental, and economic, the focus really uh, here for resilience is on reducing risk, on mitigating risk. Um, and you'll see this quote from sustainability that, that aptly demonstrates this. It's, it's also in the paper as well. And also you have a number of establishments that are, that are um, that are emerging that, that deal exclusively with resilience here. So, and what we want to outline here is that this is another key point of, of interaction here between environmentalism and this, what we call here as the World Risk Society. So, uh, quickly to finish off with, with what we're aiming to, you know, what, what we're trying to do with this paper is, is that we want to sort of provide a, a twofold theoretical contribution here. Uh, first of all, we want to show that patch generation can indeed provide a reconciliation of the agentic and structural based uh, approaches to, to, to patch change. Um, but also we want to advance the notion of, of patch generation itself because it's previously been looked at at the interaction between national and transnational. But we want to see what happens when, when the dynamics unfold entirely within transnational space. And empirically, uh, what we're trying to do here is to disentangle these different terms associated with sustainability, sustainable development, and, and resilience here. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot more detail in the paper um, if you're interested. So that's the end, and thank you for your time. Sure, thank you very much for this presentation. It was very interesting. I will just take up a question of yesterday. While I'm not a historian, I would be very much interested in your account of uh, what you take as the causes of causes. Because uh, it's a very interesting narrative that you're providing, but uh, you stated it on the last slide when you said it's a partial reconciliation. Yeah. The issue is, to me right now, this feels very much as a narrative, and it's probably it's a very interesting narrative, but I'm a little bit lost on the theoretical front. And why is that? Because I think my theory, we reduce complexity in order to increase our understanding of very small things. What you've done is you, you have not reduced complexity, you have presented the entire complexity, which is in a sense good, but um, the, the individual, I, I end up with very individual accounts 
and also with individuals, which as a former structuralist to me is something where I feel very uncomfortable. So Mr. XYZ has done this, Mr. Y has done this, and I'm like, Ooh. You know, is that is that completely contingent? And it's just because that individual was born and then he ended up in this place and then he did, you know? I would like your take on that. Well, I can, I can, provide, a, I can provide a partial answer to that. If, if you look at, um, let's say, sustainability, let's take it Stephen Schmidheine, right? He is, he is indeed a key actor here involved. But indeed there is a structural influence at work here because he was very much influenced by uh, Mont Pelerin Society through Hernando de Soto, who was, uh, who was a prominent uh, uh, member of MPS. Um, so, I mean, indeed, there are key actors here that are involved, but, uh, you know, what we also want to show in the paper is that there are broader trends which are at work influencing these actors. So, at the same time, while we do provide some sort of agentic uh, push for, for these different phases, there are sort of structural antecedents before that. There are, you know, um, rather political and, and sort of, let's say, philosophical antecedents for why these actors are engaging in, in these particular courses of action. So, um, you know, perhaps what can be done here is, is that that can be more, uh, that can be more asserted because I can, I, can, I can acknowledge that there is perhaps, uh, you know, too much agentic. Make a, a small, you know, addition on this. Actually, what, I think what what we're trying to do here is to to underscore the fact that you have different paths at the transnational level, okay? And those paths are definitely structural in the sense, Matthias, you would like structural to mean. Uh, the, w the agentic dimension is how those paths come to meet and then re-influence each other, okay? And that's where we're trying to trace the actors of that meeting. Okay, and, 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 uh, and of these multiple meetings, because as we try to underscore, we have multiple paths through the, the time period we look at, and there are multiple meeting points, in a sense. So, and, the, and the agentic di dimension is really only this, how do the, pa the paths happen to meet and then produce something new uh, from sustainability, sustainable development to sustainability, from sustainability to resilience. So, yeah. It's not really a question, but rather a commentary. I, I was just thinking about uh, a theory that studies populations and biological evolution, that is evolutionary development, because that's an approach which um, I think gives a, a pers perspective which is quite similar to yours and allows to account for uh, the role of uh, individual factors or in your narrative actors in generating systemic stabilities or paths in your theory. So um, I think that looking into theories of evolution might also be one way to go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, congratulations for this very nice narrative about the history of the ideas uh, as, as it, it is very inspiring often. Um, I have a, a question about the, your, your last point from sustainability to resilience. Do you think that uh, it's really one step uh, after sustainability, which means that now people are going more toward just resilience and this will be enough because uh, they will perceive that the scope for sustainability and the, the hope for constructing some more sustainable models and so on, which are very long-term oriented, should be uh, given up because um, the world is so frantic that you, we cannot do more than just trying to cover some uh, uh, world risk and resilience is uh, a kind of, of poor uh, actualization of sustainability? Or will you think that these two paths, the long-term view of sustainability on one side and the tool of covering high risk on the others are two different um, representations of the same realities, the second being more included in the first one? I would say, I mean, I've sort of had to go through this really quickly, but um, I, would, I would probably subscribe more to the second perspective. And the reason why I say that is because um, the crisis management that, that I've sort of alluded to within risk management is not, is not simply related to, uh, to national disasters, uh, but it's also related to, to social catastrophes such as, um, such as the Arab Spring or, or natural disasters such as hurricanes, et cetera. So indeed, there is, uh, it still retains that that core element of sustainability in catering to environmental, social, and economic. But 
it's done in a way that it's, um, it's, it's very strategic and it's very long term, but it, it is indeed framed in terms of risk mitigation. Um, so it, I, I sort of see that as being sort of the key difference between sustainability and, and resilience. But there is indeed that, that re retention of, of the three dimensions of sustainability. So. Well, I was, I was struck by various, I was struck really by the link between what was presented now and Marilo, what you presented earlier. Uh, there is an interesting kind of restating the African story into the framework that you are starting to build, uh, which I think you know is perhaps something that you are doing very consciously. I don't know. Uh, the other point I want to to uh, coming back to the comment made a minute ago, there was a there was a very interesting book done by I think by written by a French Nobel Prize in medicine or biology. I can't remember his first name, but his last name was Mono, and in French it was called Le Hasard et la Nécessité, uh, Chance and and uh, unavoidability, let's say in English. I don't know exactly how to translate it. I'm kind of struck by your story because it's really saying, I think the argument, if I understand it correctly, is basically saying there are institutional forces that create past dependency, and somehow there are people who bridge across institutional context and institutional forces and have a cognitive capability, perhaps because of multicultural backgrounds or whatever, uh, which have a cognitive capability to make those linkages between otherwise very independent institutional evolution, which have a certain necessary kind of characteristic. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's, is that the kind of the meta framework in a way from both presentations? Because indeed I was, I was first thinking this is just very narrative and I was not really getting I mean, interesting stories, but then what's the lesson out of this? So i am be trying to articulate at least in my own mind, but I want you to articulate it for me. Indeed. <laughs> indeed. <Okay. laughs> You used at some point in your presentation the term, and I'm interested in the terminology, path generation, mm -hmm. and then sustainability and resilience. Uh, and you also demonstrated it uh, diagrammically with, with, with the arrows. It all seems to me one directional. And I'm still inspired by Laurent's presentation. What about reversals? What about uh, the, the deterioration, the degeneration? Uh, making allowances for it, because in the real world, this is, uh, it, these are all processes, and there are, we move forward, we make advances incrementally, but then there's also regression. And I'm just concerned whether this is not too much of an optimistic, one-directional um, approach. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not making any teleological assumptions here that this is sort of a, a move towards, a, a move towards progress in any sense. Um, and if, if, I, if I give that impression with that diagram, uh, I apologize. But uh, what I also wanted to highlight in that is that at each different phase, there are indeed strong overlaps, but there are elements of, there are points where each phase deinstitutionalizes, like there's where it becomes fragmented and you ha allow the emergence of, of, of a new phase. Um, but, but, but by no means is that sort of uh, an, an indicator of you know, progression towards a better type of environmentalism. It's just simply a different type, so. And if I can say something just on the term past generation, as I was the one who coined it initially in a paper you know, a few years back, uh, it, it doesn't imply at all any form of progressive or normative. Uh, you know. On the contrary, it wants to take distance from past dependency, which could be actually connected more often with a progressive notion. Past generation is very open to the fact that actually the next step might be very regressive.